On this episode of Built to Last, we're gonna get down to install the floor and visit two industries that are incorporating sustainable practices into their operations. So stay tuned. Support for Built to Last is provided by Unico Incorporated, manufacturers of the small duct high velocity HVAC Unico system. Unico is dedicated to the environment and has been serving residential and commercial customers around the corner and around the globe for more than 25 years. Great Northern Lumber, providing green construction materials from skyscrapers to residential remodel. Proud to serve you for the last 27 years and into the future in the lumber industry. Bosch, power tools for professionals. Proud sponsor of The Green Home. Florida Tile, expect more. SPI Incorporated, protective coatings, proven performance, and real-world solutions for 24 years. Additional funding is provided by these firms. Our painters have done a beautiful job adding color and life to the inside of our home. Now that the walls are finished, it's time to start working on the floors. So let's get started. Now we're getting ready for our hardwood flooring. So the hardwood's on site, they're gonna be bringing in a house, start staging it, he's gonna acclimate it, and then we can start the install. We have been asked to be a part of this project we're going over radiant heat, and we needed to come up with a system to put over this radiant heat floor system. And the best system was to do a floating floor. We're using strand bamboo, which is a green product, and it's, it's perfect for this application. This is a rapidly renewable resource. Uh, the growing cycle for bamboo is typically six years. That's when bamboo reaches its maturity. What's special about this particular product is it's made from older growth bamboo for, it's actually a minimum of six years of growth, which should contribute to a better hardness and a longer durability for the product. Not all bamboo is the same. If you see bamboo advertised, do some research to find out what type of bamboo it is and how long it was allowed to grow before it was harvested. It's pre-finished, which any type of VOCs that would have normally been on, on the uh, product have already off-gassed. And uh, it goes down very easily. It also has what's called the, the uh, Green Guard certification, which assures us that any emissions that could potentially happen you know, during the install or while it's in the home are below a certain threshold that shouldn't be a threat to our indoor environmental air quality. Along with that, there is a cork substrate for the flooring, for the bamboo flooring, which isn't necessarily considered in the program, but cork in itself is also considered a rapidly renewable product. It wasn't necessarily a decision for the program, but this was one of those instances where the decision to use it as a substrate was both directed by the manufacturer and included in the warranty, as well as it fit within the sustainable goals of the homeowner. Yeah, basically, obviously, we have to clean the floor, make sure that uh, all the dust, particles, and the debris is completely off the floor. Then we lay in down an eighth inch uh, cork subfloor mat. It helps with the sound and the heat. And then after that, the bamboo gets in a, it's a woodlock system. There's no glue, there's no nails, and it's just like a puzzle piece, it goes together. We have a railing system in, in our loft area that and we can't anchor the floor solid because we have to keep the movement for the radiant floor. So what we do is we have to do a transition strip that allows a, a fixed surface and then the movement in the floating surface. So we don't have too many locations like that, but any point where we've got a fixed stair or railing transition, things like that, we have to accommodate the, uh, going from a fixed surface to a floating surface. Being that it's on a diagonal, obviously there's a little bit more, obviously for cutting, uh, more precision cutting, it flows better. It uh, makes it look bigger, it's more of a design, 
basically I'm a very big fan on a large room like this to be put a wood floor on a diagonal. This is this is as of you see right now. It's been about a two to three day process. We've probably got another one or day, one more day to finish. Um, so it's about let's say a total about a week. The homeowners are going to be happy. It's going to be a nice uh, warm floor throughout the whole space during the winter. Comfort, energy efficiency, and and uh, I think they're really going to enjoy this. While our floor installers continue to lay the bamboo floor throughout the home, Bruce meets with our home automation technicians as they begin to implement the system that will control our home's security, environmental control, lights, and more. We're on to our next phase of the project and we're going to start installing our home automation system. Even though the home automation system is one of the last items to be completed in the home, it still has to be worked in from the initial design in the beginning. All the wiring and everything has to be integrated into the home because all those things have to be done before the walls are closed up. We have to know what mechanical systems we're using, lighting, things like that, so everything can be integrated and ready for the system to be implemented at the end. Yeah, when we work with other trades, in particular with architects, um, it's really critical for us to get involved in the early, earliest possible stages of the planning. A lot of times, uh, we're looking at prints on a new construction home before anything even happens on the job site. So the earlier that uh, we can get involved to help with the planning for technology in a home, uh, we think that leads to a much better result down the road. Hey Jeff, you ready to install our home automation system? Hi Bruce, good to see you again. Yeah, just reviewing our plan here to make sure we have everything ready to go and we've got a technician on site today to start installing some devices. Can you give me a brief overview of what's going to be going on in the next couple days here? Sure, yeah, we're going to get started uh, installing all of the devices we planned for early on. Uh, we're putting in uh, security system devices and we're tying that in through automation with uh, HVAC controls uh, as well as lighting controls. The homeowner will have very easy controls through mobile apps, on-wall touchscreen, uh, and some controls will happen automatically for them. So when they leave the house, the home can drop down into a more energy efficient state. Easy technology to use? Absolutely, very easy. Very easy to use, all uh, uh, iPhone, Android based. So if you can use a mobile app, you can control the entire home. Oh, okay, terrific. I know we've got some wires hanging out of the wall that are supposed to be sensors and things like that, I was told. So all that's set to be integrated into the system now? Absolutely, yeah. We're going to start uh, putting our actual sensors into the wall. Uh, we've got a technician here with us today. His name is Joe, and he's uh, already getting started uh, putting the sensors in place. Okay, so at that point, the wires are going to disappear. I was told this will be painted to match the wall, and we won't even know it's there. Is that true? Exactly. In fact, I've got some uh, devices I can show you if you'd like, but you'll see how they just disappear into the room. So we have uh, technology that's not only functional, but uh, hidden as well from a decor oh, perspective. Oh, okay. We can take a look at it now? Absolutely. Well, Bruce, here in the master bedroom, we have one of those sensor wires that we pulled in the early pre-wire stage. Okay. These occur pretty much in every room in the house, correct? We've got one of these for every HVAC zone on the system. Okay. Uh, so traditionally, uh, what we'd have to do is put a thermostat device, hang it right on the wall where you wanted to monitor temperature for this particular zone. Okay, and there's really never a good location for these things with regard to furniture or anything else. So It's always a challenge to integrate the technology in a, in a conspicuous place in the decor. Okay. So uh, what we're able to do now though is uh, take this thermostat and we'll install it down in the mechanical room in the basement. And instead of hanging that on the wall, we can replace it with a sensor disc. It's uh, very thin, about an inch and a half diameter. It'll sit flush in the drywall and it'll monitor the temperature in this space. Uh, you could have the painters come back and touch over it. It can blend right in with the paint. It could also be wallpapered over if you have a room with wallpaper to make it disappear. Okay, so putting a finish over it doesn't affect or Im indicate anything that's on the temperature then, right? Not at all. It'll monitor the temperature in this zone just fine and everything will still be controlled by that thermostat through a mobile app or through a touch screen or through automation automatically for the homeowner. Wow, that's a great solution. Uh, now can we see where everything terminates? Absolutely. We'll show you the thermostat location down in the uh, mechanical room. So Jeff, I take it this is where everything's going to be terminated? 
Absolutely. So all of the various wires throughout the house for security and HVAC control and lighting, even telephone, internet. We have a surveillance camera as well that comes down here. All of those wires come back to this centralized location here in the mechanical room. Okay, now I assume, is there something else going on, on the wall here for this? Absolutely, we'll be putting all of the systems in place, mounting them to the wall right here where these wires are. Although these look a bit disorganized now, as you can see, uh, every single one of these wires has a unique label on it, so we know exactly where each one of these wires goes throughout the house. Uh, and we'll be terminating those onto equipment mounted here on the wall to control the house. Okay, great. Now also, is this where the thermostats are going you mentioned about? Absolutely. We talked about cleaning up the decor, taking those thermostats off the wall in favor of the temperature discs. We'll mount those thermostats here on the wall as well. Uh, no one really has to touch those because of the automation system. Uh, they'll have control through mobile apps, through the touch screen in the kitchen. Uh, and we can also write programs to have temperatures adjust automatically for the homeowner. Wow, oh, sounds great. Absolutely. It'll look even cleaner when you come back. Look forward to it. Great. We'll let you get going. Super. Jeff made this a very interesting process, very easy process for us to kind of walk through. These can normally be very complicated systems, but what he's proposing here should be easy to use and very economical and really be a great way to control the system of the house. So we should be have a very energy efficient home here. We try to really focus on things that either enhance security or enhance energy efficiency or safety or convenience and certainly there's sort of a luxurious fun aspect to some of what we do as well um, but a lot of what we do focuses on you know how do we how do we make the home more energy efficient easier to use easier to access and a lot of the technologies that have come to the market in recent years um, allow us to do that at a, at a fairly affordable price compared to five ten years ago as the technicians implement the final components of our home automation system, our flooring installers begin tile installation for the laundry room and the upstairs fireplace. For this job, we'll be using another product containing recycled material. So let's take a look at how the tiles for these areas are made. Here we are at the factory in Lawrenceburg, Kentucky. We're gonna take you through the process of how we make the porcelain floor tile. The process all starts right here with this scrap tile. We process the scrap tile back into our body. We've been doing this for about two years now. What this is doing for the environment, it's saving about 10 tons of material a day from going to the landfill. We need to grind it down to a small enough particle that it will fit into our processing equipment without doing any damage. Then we kind of use it as a filler material back into the body. Instead of sending it out to the landfill, it can be a part of our process again. It's taken a little bit of time to get the equipment and the technology into place to do this, but now that we've been doing it for about two years, it's really helping the, the environment through this process. As you can see here, we've got our pile of ground up tiles already. We grind it down to about a quarter inch size. This allows us to process the tile through our process without jamming up the equipment. You may be wondering, you see all the different colors mixed in here, does that affect the processing? Not really at all, it's such a small amount. Plus, this is a small amount of the body compared to the other raw materials that it really doesn't affect the overall color of the body of the tile. We'll take the fired scrap here along with our other raw materials and the other storage bunker, mix them together in our bomb mill and make the body of the tile. Here we are at the next step of the process where we put all the raw materials together into our batch. Darren is going to explain that to us. He's got a lot of experience working with this area. One of the things that we do when we bring the raw materials in, we then dump it into the hoppers you see behind us. The computer will then put the raw material into each individual silo. Each raw material has its own holding silo. The computer then will create a recipe of sorts and it will blend that material back onto the conveyor belt and that material will be taken out into our ball mill for further processing. Inside the factory, as you can see behind me, we've got the big equipment running. This is where the process really gets exciting, really start doing a lot of work on the raw materials. The process behind me is our continuous ball mill. What we do with this process, we take all the raw materials we looked at outside, mix them together with water to form a slurry. Also inside the ball mill, we use these different types of stones to grind the raw materials to the right particle size and also to mix all the raw materials together for the body of the tile. 
it takes about an hour and a half for the material to pass entirely through the ball mill in this part of the process. We've got silica stones in the first chamber of the ball mill. We've got the alubite balls, which are much more dense grinding media in the second two chambers. All right, here we are at the next step in the process, the pressing. We'll take the raw materials that we processed in the body preparation department and feed them into the press behind me. As you can see, we're pressing 10 tiles at a time with almost 10 million pounds of force on the large cylinder of the press. You can see this is a very dusty part of the process. All of the hoses around are actually collecting the dust, which again will go back into the body. From here in the pressing process, we'll take the tile, run it through a dryer to the glazing process. And the glazing is where we add the decoration to the surface of the tile. We'll spray the glazes on either with an airless spray application. We can put it on with a waterfall type application. And then we'll print the design. We can print it with a silicone cylinder or we can use an inkjet printer, which gives us a much more wide range, a variety of uh, printing options. Here we are at the uh, printing process. This is the last part of the tile manufacturing process before we fire the tiles. You can see behind me here, we've got one of our digital inkjet printers. Here we upload the design into the computer, and the computer will print on each tile as it passes by a different image. The number of images that we can print on the tile is only limited by the amount of storage in the computer. The other process for decorating the tile, which is a little bit more limiting, is a silicone cylinder that actually prints the design that's engraved on a silicone roller. There you can only get about four or five different images before you get a repeat. You may have noticed also on the glazing line area, there's a lot of water used. Through this process, we also recycle the water here in the factory. Any processed water that's used for cleaning up the equipment as we do a color change, that all goes to our water treatment plant here on site and gets clean and then right back into the process. We can use that in the ball mill to mix the body. We can also use it for further cleaning in the process. After the decorating of the tile, the tile is ready to go to the kiln for firing. In the firing process, that's where the tile gets its final strength. The glaze is all hardened over to the glassy form. And then the tile is ready for selection and packaging and ready to go to the customer. When the tile products are finished, they're measured by lasers and inspected for visual defects. Automatic packaging machines take care of the packaging and sorting, and then the product is ready to ship all over the country. Our tile is inspected by the installers on site, and installation in the home commences. A lot of the tile work that's being installed in the house has recycled content in it, so it is a green product and the way it's being installed is we're using green materials for the mortar and grout. So we're making sure that everything is environmentally friendly that goes into the home and how it's applied into the home. None of our adhesives or glues will have VOCs in them and a lot of our grouts and stuff will be mildew and bacteria resistant. We decided to do something a little different for the fireplace around here. We went with a tile that kind of has a look of stone, a little more subtle. Traditionally, what's either done is faced with brick or stone and stuff that's a little more coarse and rough. So we wanted to kind of tone it down and it, make it a little bit blend better with the space, not stand out as much. Obviously, the architect and the designer come up with the concept, but you leave it to the tile setter. This is something they're doing every day. It becomes their expertise. They pick up on things that you normally wouldn't draw attention to. It's something simple as an outlet location or offset corner, things like that, or how a pattern reads a running bond. So you rely on their expertise because this is something they're doing, and they know, they know the tricks of the trade and how to carry things through and bring a lot to the table when it comes to doing the installation. Now with the flooring for our general living spaces in place, we're finished with the majority of our home's construction. This presents an opportune time to see how our scraps and construction waste will be disposed of in a sustainable manner. At this facility, we recycle the construction demolition material. It comes in a co-mingled form, meaning that there's concrete, brick, block, wood, metal, drywall, all sorts of different items that are all in the same container. And what this facility that we're at today is for is to segregate those materials and send them to final market for final use or final processing. 
first step in the process is the trucks deliver the load here and then we go through a pre-sort where we check to make sure that the items that we're going to be going through are all items that we want to send up the sort line. After the loads have been dumped, they get pushed into the building where then you see the backhoe operator will then pick up the material and drop it onto a large conveyor belt. The mixed construction material is coming up the apron feeder and it's dropping onto a finger screen deck where it has been sorted into three different sizes. The larger materials that are going to be hand sorted are going to come over the top. The other material that's three to eight inches is going to drop down below. That product will then be have metals taken off, aluminums taken off, and various other products. What will drop down to the bottom deck will be items like gravel, dirt, rock that can be used for building roads. At this stage in the process, the three to eight inch material is coming off a separate conveyor belt where it's automatically separating out all the smaller mid-sized metal products and dropping it into this container. After each shift, this container will be all the way filled up with ferrous steel. At this stage, they're separating metal products, cardboard, paper, three different types of wood, concrete, brick, block, rigid plastics, vinyl siding, carpeting. All these items are being picked by each person. They each have different bins and items that they're looking for and separating out throughout this recycling process. This bunker over here is right now receiving clean wood that can be used for mulch recycling. We have other types of wood that will be used through the wood to energy, replacing coal. It's using clean wood to power a power plant. On a daily basis, we ship out almost 100 tons of product for energy. We have a conveyor belt that's actually separating out gravel, grit, and concrete and rock that is actually used for building roads. Next, we have cardboard, paper products. All the unpainted drywall, we actually separate out and we, and we send that off for further processing. They'll take the drywall paper that's on it, shred it, and mix it with wood for animal bedding. They'll take the gypsum that's left over and grind it to almost a flower type consistency and they'll use it for land application to, uh, as a soil amenity. We're separating out concrete, brick and block and dropping into the container and that will be crushed and used for also road building. They're residing a house, not only aluminum siding gets recycled but also vinyl siding. And vinyl siding is new to the market, came about in the past two to three years but has really taken off and that recycling is now available to all of our contractors as well ferrous metals, which is all the steel, and that product is dropping down through the sorting process where it can also be recycled and turned right back into steel. One of the items that we recycle for throughout the construction load, as part of the construction and demolition process, is we find in our loads carpet padding as well as carpeting. Carpet padding, we separate the material, then they'll take this material and they'll shred it and they'll use it for various products that they'll return to market with. This bin is nylon carpeting, which can be used Within the automotive industry, it gets baled and then gets melted back down, and it's nylon, and nylon's a readily used material through manufacturing various types of plastic parts. During another part of the recycling process are magnets that are separating out different types of nails, screws, nuts, and bolts, and this is done automatically with a magnet belt. So these hundreds of tons of nails all go right back to market, getting melted down and used within steel products throughout the United States. After the wood has been separated out during the recycling process, then it's brought over where the material has been shredded, and then the product can either be used for wood for mulch, for dyed mulch, or this wood can be used for wood to energy. We use an 800 horsepower Vermeer shredder that actually shreds the material to make the spec for the wood to energy facility and also for making wood for mulch. It shreds big two by fours to little particles like this. When a roofer comes by and tears off the roof, they put it in a container, and then that container is brought to the facility. This product is then ground to a texture that almost looks like black sand. That material is then blended with asphalt at the asphalt plants that can be then used to help build strong roads and cuts down on the use of the amount of crude oil that has to be used to make asphalt for pavement. During the recycling process, we get all sorts of different types of materials as well, such as brick, concrete, clay, various other types of items that can be used throughout the construction industry as a reuse in the building process. So if you can just imagine all this wood and carpeting and metal and asphalt shingles and concrete brick and block used to be just dumped in the local landfills. And now as landfills have gone farther and farther away, 
We have now figured out alternatives to use to recycle all these products for green buildings, lead construction, and just to save the planet and save our earth and putting it to good use. Our installers did a great job of making sure the floor we walk on is as beautiful as the rest of our home's interior. Join us next time on Built to Last as we work on some of the more personal spaces of our home. See you then. Visit the Built to Last website to learn about these topics and more. Support for Built to Last is provided by Unico Incorporated, manufacturers of the small duct high velocity HVAC Unico system. Unico is dedicated to the environment and has been serving residential and commercial customers around the corner and around the globe for more than 25 years. Great Northern Lumber, providing green construction materials from skyscrapers to residential remodel. Proud to serve you for the last 27 years and into the future in the lumber industry. Bosch, power tools for professionals. Proud sponsor of The Green Home. Florida Tile. Expect more. SPI Incorporated, protective coatings, proven performance, and real-world solutions for 24 years. Additional funding is provided by these firms.